Live preview. We've just about caught our breath after an eventful weekend in the Premier League last time out, and another round of fixtures is swiftly upon us. Topping the bill in match week 13 is Chelsea versus Manchester United. Watford host Manchester United. You know, we should do better. They simply can't afford to slip up here. We think we will do better. And there is Joshua King! And Manchester United unpicked yet again. Saar, what a shocking first half. Disaster. That was about as bad as it's got. What a calamity. Would you believe it? It was embarrassing. It was a nightmare. Five defeats from their last seven league games. How much longer can this go on for you, wonder? How low are you feeling right now? Very. Well, breaking news, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has been sacked. A daunting trip to high-flying Chelsea is next for struggling United. The league table then, Chelsea are still in top spots. West Ham can draw level on points with City with a win. And United need three points to stop the gap widening to the sides above. And then at the bottom, Newcastle are five points adrift of safety. Norwich are still in the relegation zone, but back-to-back -back wins keeps them within touching distance. And a win for Steven Gerrard on his managerial debut at Aston Villa has moved them up to 15th. And joining me to preview this weekend's Premier League games, we've got James Collins, Owen Hargreaves and Raphael Honigstein. Good to see you all. I mean, what a week it's been. So much has changed, particularly at Manchester United, because the last time we sat here last weekend, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was still the manager. He's out the door. Michael Carrick currently in charge. And I know you watched them in Europe this week, Owen. Was there a big difference? There was a difference. Yeah, there was a difference, but there had to be a difference. I mean, the Liverpool game was... was was bad and then the Man City game was was terrible and then the Watford game was a disaster so it's not surprised that Oli had to lose a job you know he had to stop the bleeding at some point but the game against Villarreal was a tricky one against an experienced team with an experienced manager and you know def the biggest issue has been defensively they've been so poor defensively and Michael Carrick tidied that up you know they didn't concede a goal so that's a positive but there's still so much so much work to be done and it's great to see that there's actually some football people at the football club Ralph Rangnick, incredible experience, over I think 600 games managed as a manager, uh, knows the game in and out. And that's what the football club needs. You know, you've got guys that are in the banking sector, they're making football decisions. It's, 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 it's crazy. So great that they've got somebody there and uh, I think he's going to do a great job. Well, it's perfect that we have Raphael Honigstein with us, a German football expert. I know you're going to tell us a lot about Ralph Rangnick throughout the show, but for now, do you see this as a good appointment for Manchester United? I think it's a really good appointment. He comes, I think, at the right age with the right experience to handle a dressing room. He's got a clear vision and clubs often veer from one extreme to the next. So if something doesn't work out, then they go to the opposite. And in many ways, Rangnick is the opposite of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. He doesn't have any Man United pedigree, he doesn't necessarily connect emotionally with the, with the fans or with the club. But he brings structure, a very clear, concise idea of how he wants to play. Um, can really improve players individually, can improve the team collectively. All the things that we're missing uh, when it comes to very, really detailed ideas, I think he will provide. I don't know if it's, all, if it's ever a good time to play, uh, to play uh, against teams because that, that would mean we, we, we think that we know something or can predict something. You can see it either way. Uh, in the end, you, you, we will not lose too many minutes uh, thinking about this, but, but we will give all our um, energy and con focus on, on our squad and what we want to do right. We only have one game with Michael Carrick in charge to, to focus on and to analyze. Of course, we have some individual behavior and some group behavior that we think can be like, uh, that we can see as patterns and want to prepare our team for it. And on the other side, this is always the best moment to play against Manchester United because we are up for the for the for the big challenges, and we wanna wanna be out there to to play on the highest level, to 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 prove ourselves and to to prove a point. And we just come from a from a tough match, and and there's the next one. This is where we are and where we love to be, and this is uh, we we get um, we get challenged on highest level again on Sunday. Well, firstly, about the, the, the Chelsea, you know, you've got to be hugely impressed by the way they, they, they go about things. Um, obviously, watch, watch quite a bit of them. And um, 
super intense, you know, well organised, uh, really good movement across the f our, our back line, their front line, um, and very good at connecting connecting with uh, with the midfield, you know, with with the back three building up and connecting into midfield and kind of narrow you up, give you problems through the middle and, and with the wing backs, really uh, aggressive and, and, and playing really high. Then they test your back line and stretch you across the pitch. So. Um, yeah, they, they, they've got a really good balance going at the moment. Uh, obviously, confidence is high. You can see that uh, they've had some really terrific results. So they're on a high, and um, yeah, well aware of of, of of the challenges that we face. But um, you know, as I said before, looking forward to it because it, it is a, it is a big test and a big challenge. But you know, we, we feel that we can go there and, and get a good result, no doubt. So that we have to think that we have to believe that, and, and I certainly do. Well, it looks as though this may be Michael Carrick's last game as caretaker manager of Manchester United. Short for sweet, and that's because Ralph Rangnick, it looks like... I keep trying to pronounce that correct in the that's German close way. Close enough. Right? Close enough, Thank Jules. We'll um, let you off. <laughs> it's looking as though he's agreed terms with Manchester United now. Tell us what you know about this, Rafa. Well, where do you want to start? Everywhere. Um, Tell us everything. The agreement is very close. I think it's mostly down to technicalities. He needs to have a work permit. Um, it's not that straightforward. It's going to take a bit of time, but there is no reason why this uh, should fall through now. Um, it's hugely exciting, I think, for uh, anyone connected with Man United because he is a, a real, interesting, innovative, very, very well-defined football thinker, if you will, who influenced a lot of the modern German cultures. Thomas Tuchel was a player under him and Rangnick Forten. This guy looks very bright. Um, go and scouts the opposition and he comes back a coach eventually. Uh, same with Julian Nagelsmann a few years later. They work together. Um, there's a whole list of, of um, coaches and former players who become managers inspired by his very clear idea of coaching. And I'd be interested to hear Owen's view because when you were in Germany, I think there were very few clubs that were doing the kind of stuff that he did. Yeah. German coaching at the time was still more like go out, express yourself, yeah. be strong, play with confidence. And he was the opposite. He was about the system, about patterns, about space, about pressing at a time when no one did it um, you know, regularly. And uh, I, I'm just so excited to see him in the Premier League because I think he deserves that kind of big job, that big occasion. Was that evident to you? Yeah, every job he touched, he turned, you know, he improved significantly. I mean, I think the first one was Ulm. You remember Ulm, the tiny little team, he, they came out of nowhere. So you think about Hoffenheim and you think about the Red Bull projects, you know, Leipzig and Salzburg. And he is, uh, he's an innovator, you know, and he's, he's, he's a football man. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, I think he's got great experience. He plays the right way. You know, our team, when Bayern played against someone in the Bundesliga, we didn't have to do too much in terms of detail because we were better than the opposition most of the time. But you notice, I remember, I think he said he... They beat one of Jurgen Klopp's teams 4-1. And after Jurgen Klopp said he wanted his teams to play like that. I mean, how big a compliment do you want to make somebody? Well, the fact that Jurgen Klopp has said today that it's not a good thing for Liverpool, yeah. that he's going to be managing in the Premier League, kind of says it all. Well, it does. And, you know, and Thomas Tuchel has said pretty much the same thing. You think about the way he's inspired. Look, all the, I, I text one of my friends, uh, Bastian Schweinsteiger, today. I said, the Germans are taking over the Premier League. <laughs> you know, because, you, you know, and it's... It's amazing because, look, they did such a great job of, of educating these coaches that kind of the next generation. And I think that, that's great. And I think that's what you see the best coaches, you know, pretty much a lot of the best coaches all around the world are, are German at the moment. So credit to, to him for inspiring that generation. And maybe they've taken on his, his teachings and tweaked it a little bit to, to their style. But, I mean, to get a compliment from Tuchel and Klopp, <laughs> I mean, you couldn't get any bigger ones. Has he been close to taking a job in the Premier League before now? I know he's 60, 62. Yeah, so he had an offer from Chelsea in January to come in as an interim manager, but he thought four months is not really enough. Um, he got close to Everton before Carlo Ancelotti took over there. I think in the past people have been a little bit afraid of him because he wasn't really clearly defined anymore as a, as a coach. People saw him as the sporting director, as the club builder, and they thought, if I hire him, is he going to take over the whole club? And maybe, as you said, the club is run by non-football people. They think, oh... You know, I have a real football CEO here. Maybe the owners think, I no, I'm no longer necessary. They can have him run the whole club. So I think they, that scared them a little bit. Is that as much a concern as people make that, you know, people use that, like, not control freaks, not fair, but that he, that he wants kind of ultimate control? Is it that extreme? I think, I think in the past it was the case because 
at Hoffenheim at Leipzig, he was given basically a, a, a blank sheet of paper and said, build us a club. Yeah. And then over five, six, seven, eight years, you did. build a club from the lower leagues to the Champions League side. And when you do that and you have full control over who's the bus driver, who's the greenkeeper, who's the second, third assistant under 17 coach, then somebody tells you suddenly, oh, you have to play, buy this player and I'm going to buy you that left back and you want, that's, that's hard. Yeah. I, you, but so. I think now, you know, a few years later, having had the break, he's in a position where the passion for actually the pure coaching has come out again. And the, uh, the prospect of working with this Man United team and giving them the kind of structure that they're really crying out for, I think supersedes any other concerns. I don't think he wants to come in and secretly think, ah, you know, if I do well, then I can take over the whole club and then I can buy all the players. I don't think he thinks like that. I think he just wants to enjoy the coaching and, and get back to that coaching that's been missing a bit. Do you think he works with what he has or do you think he tries to force his methods onto a group of players? That is, that... That is the most interesting question and I'm not sure he has the answer yet. I think he'll want to first see what are these players like. Can I actually take them on the journey with me or will they refuse to buy into me and I'll have to adjust. I think that's going to be the fascinating story. Again, coaches usually have a lot of power. They say, if you don't want to play my game, fine, I'll buy another, I'll buy another person. Um, at Leipzig, at Hoffenheim, he wouldn't buy players who were over 23 because he felt, I can't really play a pressing game with players who are 28, 29 and maybe on their third or fourth contract to a little bit more sophisticated. I want the hungry guys. I want the guys who are going to go and run and run and run. He's not going to be able to utilize that same vision at Man United. It's the op almost the opposite. But I think he's clever enough and has enough of a man management touch to adjust the ideas and to get people on board, even if he have to, has to compromise a little bit. I think that is the really interesting side, because when you look at the Manchester United squad on paper, you would assume that they could go on to a achieve something this season. There's still a long way to go in this campaign, but the current form guide is not looking good. Lost five of their last seven Premier League games, and you can see the problems on the pitch. I mean, look at that for stats, Rafa. Yeah. That says it all. They are worse than Newcastle, who haven't won a game yet this season. <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the things that I guess people have had doubts in Rafa Agnick before is that he's not really won anything. So people are saying, well, where are the trophies to kind yeah. of back up all of this brilliant philosophy and yeah. strategy that, that we speak of so highly? So what would you say yeah. to those people? I think it's slightly the wrong way to look at it because when you are tasked with taking a third division side into the Bundesliga <laughs> yeah. and you do that with back-to-back -back promotions and you do it again uh, with another team and make them into a Champions League team in the space of five years of the club being existing, then you're winning. You might not winning a trophy, but you happen to do your job and you're doing it better than a lot of other coaches who perhaps by virtue of being in a job with a team automatically have a better chance of winning. I mean, I often say, maybe it's a little bit unfair, but Roberto Di Matteo, Champions League winner, is he a better coach than Poch. Ralf Rangnick mm -hmm. or Pochettino? Probably not, because we've seen their body of work over a number of years and coaching, I think, ultimately has to be measured not so much in trophies, but in... What are my resources and how much I'm getting out? Mm -hmm. If I'm constantly getting out more out of my resources than you'd expect, or at least get like close to the maximum all the time, mm -hmm. I think I'm a better coach, even if that translates into keeping a team up that should be going down or keeping a team and getting a team into Europa League that should be a relegation battling team than somebody who is just in a position where there's a 50-50 chance almost of winning. And again, when I come to you, buy a Munich coach at your time, almost a coin flip if you, win a champ if you win a championship or not by virtue of being there. And we've seen in recent years, coaches have been at Bayern who weren't very good, not to name any names, maybe I should, <laughs> Niko Kovac. <laughs> um, he was pretty good. It, oh. <laughs> he was, he was a double winner. Yeah. Because he's a Bayern Munich coach. Look, Ralf Rang Rangnick took Schalke to a Champions League semi-final and that wasn't a team that should have been a Champions League semi-final. I can't think of one job that he's done where he hasn't overachieved, not one. So I'm with Raf, you know, that whole trophy thing. I'm not, I'm not too worried about that, you know, because I think if he's never had a group of players like this, this is almost like, you know, for his body of work over all the years he's been in football, mm. this is like a, probably a gift to him. And now he'll probably want to see himself. I've normally worked with young guys and hungry guys. Now I get pretty much a finished product mm. and I'm the architect of it. Let's see if we can go on and win something big. He's probably not 100% sure either. But I tell you what, it's an exciting opportunity to take that group with his experience 
and say, now, now let's see what we can achieve. I think the sky's the limit. I really do. But in Germany, Fingerspitzengefühl means that, like the finger feeling. You know, he's going to have to get in there and see what, when can I push and when I got to back off and when do I got to bring the older guys on board, and, you know, and Varane and Ronaldo's and get their opinion because I think it's going to take, it's going to be delicate the first few weeks. From what you guys are saying here, James, it sounds to me that if he does well, this could actually mean he lasts longer than just until the end of the season? What do you think? Well, certainly, it, it all depends on <laughs> management. It all depends on results, you know. Like I say, it'd be interesting to see, like, no disrespect to the players he's worked with in Germany, but like, like Owen said, he's going into a, the quality of the squad he's going into. It'd be interesting to see how he does it, how his coaching methods work with the players, like I say, who, who already the finished start. They're called not, not boys he's, he's sort of bringing through. So um, if he goes in and does well, you know, what, why, why wouldn't they give it to him? Okay. The one thing is, Jules, the fixtures are very kind to them you know, for the next couple of months. So you could see United going on a really big run. And then I think, obviously, his position is, you know, significantly improved. Apart from this game at the weekend. Yeah, yeah, forget the Chelsea one, they're not going to win that. Um, yeah. Let's talk about Chelsea then, top of the league. I mean, they're doing so well, James, at the moment. It doesn't look like anyone can stop them. They've only lost once this season in the league, and that was mm. to Manchester City. And um, when you look at their numbers and what they're achieving so far compared to other title-winning seasons... It's basically the best there's ever been, bar the amount of goals conceded, where they've only once conceded less at this stage of a campaign. But when you look at the amount of goals scored this time mm. round, it's considerably more. Are they still your favourites to go on and win it? They are. They look unstoppable to me at the minute. Both ends of the pitch, solid defensively, and, and, and you know creating numerous chances every game and scoring lots of goals. So for me at the minute, obviously there's so much quality, you know, Man Manchester City, Liverpool, but at the minute, Chelsea look the, the full package and you'd, you'd, I really struggle to see a team that's going to, you know, going to knock them off, off the top of the table at the moment. Yeah, Lukaku was back on the bench for Chelsea in the Champions League against Juventus. Do you expect him to start this game? Well, I think the, this, you know, the manager and his philosophy is more important than the individual players. And that's basically been proven. The fact that he's done all that, conceded four goals in 12 games. I mean, that's... Only one from open play is incredible. That's crazy. So, it, obviously, it doesn't really matter who's kind of popping in. Mendy obviously always plays. You know, I think Rudiger pretty much always plays. But there's so many guys that can dip in and out. You know, Reese James has been unbelievable in that right wing-back position, but they've done it without Pulisic, without Lukaku, Mason Mountain's missed time, Ziyech has, has barely played. So to think that he's, any time he slots anybody in, it doesn't matter. They all perform, and that's a sign of a really great coach. So I think they're the favourites, but I still think Man City are the best watch. But I think they're the, they're the team that probably plays the best together, and essentially that's all football is about. And just another quick one on the squad. Chilwell picked up what looks like quite a bad injury. He's going to be out for a few weeks, we're hearing. Does Alonso just slip straight back into that spot and that just shows the squad depth that Thomas Tuchel has? Yeah, and it also shows how much uh, Thomas Tuchel had an impact because Marcus Alonso is one of those guys who looked like they're completely sort of gone, past it, uh, under, under Lampard. Uh, like, no longer good enough mm. even to play in the Premier League. And uh, Tuchel has resurrected him and, and others. I'm thinking of Barkley and, you know, there's so many players, Loftus-Cheek, um, there's so much going on when it comes to keeping everybody happy but still having a very tactical, cohesive system. And I think that is the, the, the magic of this, of this Tuchel reign. I didn't think that he would be so defensively solid because from what we saw at PSG and at Dortmund, they were exciting, they were entertaining, but they were also quite open at times. This Chelsea team are just so solid. It's just incredible. Yeah. All right, well, from everything you guys have said, I think we should get a prediction from you two for now. We're going to save James for the end of the show. What do you think is going to happen? Because you've talked up what could happen with Manchester United, but of course, Ralph Rangnick isn't quite there yet. So what do you think for this game? I think Chelsea too strong, 2-0. Yeah, I think Chelsea win, but I think 2-1. I think, I think Chelsea win 2-1. OK, right.